This is one of the more interesting nights I've ever had, and, and I say that most sincerely. Uh, I rarely get the opportunity to see a community come together, celebrate, if you will, its commitment to the well-being of others. And I thought that film uh, really encapsulated it all. Uh, when we were sitting at the dinner table, the question comes up, how did we go from this tremendous sense of community to the enormous system of hostility that we currently have throughout the United States? And I can't answer that question, but I will try. I'll try in the sense that, first of all, one of the opportunities of being governor is you get to travel throughout the state. And you begin to realize in a short period of time that Minnesota is a collection of communities, all like yours. They may have different values, different emphasis, but overall, they're very, very comparable. The dilemma we get ourselves into is we use words like community and we don't define it. But if you were to define your community here in Brainerd, what is it you would say about it? You would say, one, it's a beautiful place. We've got these marvelous lakes. That's what you people sell all the time. <laughs> and it's a tremendous draw. There's no, absolutely no question about it. But that, it does not define your community. What defines your community are the people and how they engage with each other. We define community in the context of this is where I work, this is where I live, this is where I play, this is where I celebrate, this is where I cry. In other words, all of our human experience is done in the context of our relationship, if you will, with other people. And we brag about our communities. Come to my community because I'll tell you, we have the best hospital you've seen. We have the best business community. We have the best schools. We have the best everything. All of that holds true until your legislators come to the Capitol and plead poverty. <laughs> But it's that kind of connectedness that brings us together. And I think somewhere between the community and that which governs us from above, we have a huge, huge disconnect. And if we don't heal that disconnect, we're in for some very serious tough sledding. Let me, if I may, talk about some of the things that we can do. First of all, every community, I would argue, has an obligation to take a positive view towards the whole broad area, if you will, of public service. Today, barely a day goes by that someone holding public office doesn't kick the daylights out of those terrible bureaucrats those ter terrible people on the other side of the aisle, those terrible people that occupy the White House, the governorship, whatever it may be. Now let's reverse that and bring it to business. Can you imagine a CEO walking in in the morning and say, boy, I've got the worst workforce in the history of mankind. And boy, do I dislike them. And half of those VPs I can't stand. No. Every CEO will tell you without exception that the greatest asset they have are their people. I came back from a board meeting this morning. We hired a new CEO and this was his first opportunity to report back on his first six months in office. The one thing he stressed was his communication system of how he goes to various plants all over the country talks to employees, engages employees, regularly brings them in on the goals, objectives, where is the company going, the role that you play in achieving those kinds of goals, and then the profitability. And the response is enormous. 
Any business leader will tell you anytime you have a high turnover, you have a serious problem of both productivity and ultimately success. People want to feel proud of what they do. They want to feel proud of their accomplishments. They want to come home in the evening and tell their spouse about something important that they did today, regardless of what it may be. And that value system is what brings communities together. That's why you're here tonight, because you love your community. You're proud of your community. When you go outside your community, you brag about the virtues of your community. Now let me, if I may, shift to that generation which we all refer to as the greatest generation. And how that generation gave to us a remarkable set of values which lasted for a good number of years. And it's those values that are now disintegrating and causing our alarm and frankly our fear. But when you think back, that generation lived through the Depression. And during the Depression, there was a commonality of impoverishment. We're all in this together. And we're going to get out of this together. It wasn't about how I'm going to do it. It was about how we are going to do it. And no sooner did we start to make modest gains towards prosperity or towards normalcy, if you will, than we're thrust into World War II. Now, some of you are old enough to recall 1941, 42, etc., and how young men, 17 years old, went down to the enlistment station and joined up and joined up literally by the millions. A good friend of mine came off a Nebraska farm. He was six foot four. And he hitchhiked his way all the way down to Texas to enlist in the Air Force. He wanted to be a pilot. I asked him, how at six foot four did you possibly qualify to be a pilot? He said, well, one, they weren't terribly particular, and two, I hunched over. <laughs> Within a year, he was piloting bombers of the Palesta oil fields in Romania, one of the most dangerous missions of World War II, where on occasions less than half of the planes ever came back. And this is a person who still wasn't even 20 years old. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of comparable stories. And yet the one thing you never heard was complaints. I remember as a little boy going down to church on a Sunday morning to Gustavus Adolphus Church. Every Swede had to be brought up Lutheran. <laughs> and there was a cobblestone, I seem to recall, a cobblestone street. And New York City was a disembarkation point for troops going overseas. And then battalion after battalion of black soldiers marching. No jokes, no laughs, no smiles. All I could see on their faces was anxiety and fear. Now think what it was like in 1941, 1942 to be told you're going to go overseas on an ocean you barely heard of, on waters you knew nothing about. You've got to remember, prior to World War II, people didn't travel much. And then you're going to go to a country somewhere that nobody told you, and you're going to fight. But we forget about how young these people were. And when they came back, they gave us the national leadership all the way from President Kennedy through George Bush I. No generation has had a greater impact 
on American history than they did, with the possible exception of our founding fathers. That's an extraordinary length of time for one generation to dominate. My generation, and for some of you, yours, we never got the presidency. We were skipped over. That's one of the reasons it was such a very difficult adjustment to go from George Bush I to Bill Clinton, from a person who was a hero in World War II to a war protester. And I don't say that with, with any sense of a bias toward one or, or the other. But what I'm saying is, for America, that was a radical shift. And you'll notice in the Clinton years how difficult it was for him to assimilate into the American culture until finally it became a very successful administration as we began to understand the various generational differences. But the greatest generation left us a legacy that I would like to see us reconnect with. You have already reconnected. You never lost it. You're fortunate. But it has to be spread. How many times do you hear people today say, what's in it for me? It's the first question. What's in it for me? Well, what was in it for that 17-year-old who enlisted in the Army to go to Normandy? Not much. But we hear this constant thumping of me first instead of we. What we inherited from the greatest generation was we, the power of we. You as members of this community recognize that you have more strength as a community than any of you do as individuals. Once you recognize that reality, you can perform almost anything. And you have. You have built a successful community. The second thing is the recognition of responsibility. Community is not all about coming together to celebrate. It's also assuming responsibility for those who are falling behind. How many times have we heard sermons on God gave us two hands, one with which to climb the ladder of success and the other to reach down and help someone else? That is the essence of community. That's why in World War II, as so many veterans look back on that war, they use the phrase band of brothers. The one thing anyone who has ever served in the military learns very, very quickly is that there is no I. Because your life depends upon the performance of your friends, your buddies around you. And believe me, you're very indifferent to their color, to the nationality, to the race. All of the differences disappear. You have one common element, mutual help, mutual support. You are buddies. How many of you in this room have had occasion to talk to some of the veterans? And then they talk about they're lost buddies, and they start to well up. And you realize that through all those decades, that pain, that memory, still was a vital part of their life. That's how much those moments meant to them. We're still seeing veterans who want to go back over and annually visit Normandy, and some of the battles where they fought. And how I wish the American government, all of us, in, in sheer gratitude, would pay for every veteran's trip. We owe them that much. Now, I've been asked by the foundation if I would talk a little bit about my own story. I do that with some reluctance. But if it lends meaning or dimension, so be it. Well, we were talking about the one hand to climb that so-called ladder of success and the other to reach back. And we hear so much today about people pounding their chest and said, I did it alone. 
No, you didn't. Yes, it takes a village to educate a child, but more importantly, it takes a village to virtually accomplish anything. I don't think there's one single person in this room that has not been the benefactor of a hand reaching down and providing help. And once you accept that help, you also accept with it the responsibility to provide that hand to someone else and to help pull them up. So they can become part, if you will, of the American dream. But I remember in the fall of 1948, I was given a scholarship to this school called the Choate School in Wallingford, Connecticut. It was a preparatory school. It was a school largely for the sons of well-to-do families. I had gone to a camp. My father was very active in the church and ran a little organization known as the Boys Club. And he felt in the Bronx that the kids only saw cement and wouldn't it be nice if we went to places that had green grass or the Statue of Liberty or whatever it was. So on weekends, he would try to take the kids to various places. And then he went down to the community chest and he said, you know, I'd like to know if there are any camps available for some of these kids. And they said, yes, there are. Well, I was the benefactor, if you will, of one of those camps. And it was up in Wallingford, Connecticut. It was sponsored by the Choate School. It was called St. Andrew's Camp. And it wasn't much of a camp when I look back. <laughs> Not by the standards you have here in Brainerd, I'll tell you that. <laughs> It was several acres of, of pasture with a little creek that came through it, and uh, then the water was dammed up into a, what they called a swimming hole. And on one side were cows, and you know what cows do on their side. <laughs> and on the other side were us campers swimming, and in between were an endless array of bloodsuckers. <laughs> but to us, it was absolute godsend. We loved it. We tr truly did. Our fancy camp consisted of tents that were left over from World War I, put on a platform, oh, that's true, and then cots. That was my first experience with the Army cot. I hoped it was my last, but I was wrong. <laughs> but we loved it. And then we had this one house where we were fed. And I, there was the first time in my life I came across this thing known as the blueberry pancake. That was the most magnificent invention ever. <laughs> but it was a magnificent experience. And the, and the counselors were, the, were some juniors and seniors that went to this thing called Choate. And the head counselor was a big fella named Butch Packard. You, uh, Hubert Packard was his real name, but he was massive and he had a deep voice and could tell the most terrifying, horrible stories imaginable at night. So that when you went back to, 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 to your cot, you, you were in total terror. <laughs> and the counselors got together, just as you have as a community, and said, you know what, it would be nice if we could create a scholarship. Choke didn't have any scholarship program in those days except to those people who were in the academic world or religious leaders. And to make a long story short, I was given that scholarship. And you can imagine what a terrifying experience it is to get off the train and go to this, actually it's about as large easily as the campus of St. Olaf. Beautiful facility, marvelous place. They had a whole winter exercise building, I'll never believe it, indoor baseball field. During World War II, the Boston Braves used to spring train there. I mean, you talk about facilities, they had it. And here was this undernourished kid from the Bronx about to assimilate into the school. Well, when I got there, they decided to give me a test. Well, the first test was on grammar. Well, my magnificent education of the Bronx hadn't included anything about this word grammar. <laughs> and how in the world was I going to conjugate all those sentences and separate nouns from adjectives, adverbs, etc.? And the answer is I didn't. 
So I sat there for two hours looking at this paper, leaving it totally blank. And then I was given a two-hour test in another word that was a little bit foreign to me called algebra. I mean, I had no idea what x and y equaled. <laughs> another blank paper. I can tell you one thing, I set the all-time standard for the lowest entry grades in the history of the Cho School, and there's no chance anyone can ever break it. <laughs> well, for a kid whose self-esteem was somewhere around the lower part of his feet, I went back to my cottage, I was tearful, and packed my bags and figured that they're gonna come and put me on the six o'clock train. Well, then all the kids came back from athletics and nobody came to throw me out. Then they all went to dinner, so I trailed along and said, well, I may as well eat dinner too. I wasn't gonna sit in the cottage by myself. And then after dinner came back and there were some lists posted on the, on the bulletin board. And my gosh, my name was on it. I was actually given classes I could go to. Now, truth be known, it was the dumbbell section and everything. <laughs> But I was in. And it was a marvelous, marvelous experience. And it slowly started to build your sense of self-esteem as you get along with you. You know how kids are. They, they over time, whatever shortcomings they have, they kind of yield and you all grow together. And then I remember Choate was very much into predestination. It was based very much on the Eaton model of, of England. The master called me up to his room and there's a very tall southerly gentleman. And back in those days, which is sort of pre-television, the South really had a gorgeous and distinct accent. And he slowly started to talk about his duties as a housemaster and this wonderful, charming southern voice from Barlow, Kentucky. His name was Vivian Jesse Barlow from Barlow, Kentucky. And he said, one of the things I do is I do a bed check at night to make sure all my little boys are in bed safely tucked away. And he said, I'll go to this room and there he's tucked away and that room he's tucked away and that room he's tucked away. Then I come to this room and I find a pillow and a blanket and I say I wonder where my little boy is and then I go to the bathroom and I see these two little feet there I say I wonder whose two little feet they can be well by this time my heart is down on my ankles and I'm figuring now another axe is going to certainly fall and then his voice changed and he said tomorrow everything will be posted. You will be elevated into the honors program. You've been elected vice president of your class. And you've been chosen to the Choate News, which means you'll be editor in chief as a senior. Now that sounds just wonderful, but I don't say it for that purpose. But then I got the most sober lecture I've ever had in my life on responsibility. That okay, he was willing to bend the rules to allow me an opportunity to catch up. But now that part of the game was over. From here on out, I would not be granted any edge. You had to be on your own. And I've never forgotten that because that is precisely the essence of what you do. You are that hand that reaches down, and in reaching down, you're giving that person an opportunity, not guaranteeing their success, but an opportunity to effectively compete and get back on their feet. And we've all needed that assistance in our life. And so as you work with your foundation, and as you work in the lives of your community, I hope all of us can remember that we have a responsibility. One, that responsibility is to give to the state legislature, to give to the United States Congress your very best and your brightest. 
That's an obligation you have and you can't shirk it off. And you've got to ask yourself, have I done that? Have I been doing that? Secondly, am I promoting to these, to these public offices those people who have the capacity to understand what community is? Community is not about me getting my way. Community is about working together towards common goals, goals that are agreed upon. Why can we do it in business? Why can we do it in the foundation? Why can we do it in all of our enterprises except our political enterprise? The answer is we can, but it starts with us. And it starts with us remembering in a very humble fashion that there but for the grace of God go I. And that's the honest truth. I look back so many times and I say, I wonder what ash heap I would have landed on had not that hand come out and helped. And I have a suspicion everyone here has had a comparable experience. I really thank the foundation, I mean that most sincerely, for the work that it has done, for its collaboration and spreading to other communities. I truly hope that we have this kind of a foundation effort in every single community in Minnesota. Because we have the challenges of assimilating people that are different from us. We have the challenge of assimilating homeless children. We have the challenge of making sure that education-wise, our children will be comparable in training and capacity to compete with the very best from all the industrialized nations of the world. And so I thank you, and, and this has been a true delight for my wife and I to come here tonight to share this evening with you, but more importantly to thank you for the superb work that you have done. I salute you. Thank you very much.